Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. So grateful that I can be here today and worship with you all. My name is Gabriel Collier, and I am a junior Bible and English major at Erskine College. After I graduate from Erskine next year, I hope to go to Asbury Theological Seminary to get a dual Master's of Theology and Master's of Divinity degree, and then start to uh, become a pastor. I've done this for about five years. I've uh, been preaching since I was 16, so I'm really excited that I can be here today. Uh, pastor Richard and I actually met in mentor classes. The conference makes us do mentors. Uh, we go through these classes when we start the process of ordination. So him and I met last year. And then I get a text message uh, at the beginning of this week and said, hey, can you come preach for me? I said, I'll be more than glad. So I'm thankful that y'all have allowed me to be here. Again, it's great to be here. And the situation with him and his aunt, of course, that's sad. I need to remember them in prayers. But it's just great that we can be here together. This morning, we have a few announcements. If you turn to the back of your bulletin. Um, the first one is that the soup luncheon is January 28th following the morning service. So please, if you haven't already done so, sign up for that. And the second thing is there is a char card, ugh, I cannot talk, <laughs> call charge conference on January 30th at 6.30 p.m. Are there any other announcements this morning? Let us pray. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open and all desires are known. Cleanse us by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may more perfectly love you and more wonderfully magnify your name. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our first hymn this morning is found on page 540, I Love Thy Kingdom, Lord.
You may be seated. You will join with me on page 84, 854 for our first scripture lesson, our responsive reading, Psalm 139. Again, that's page 854. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. Yeah, when I sit down and I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down, and are acquainted with all my ways. Even the four words on my tongue, Lord, you know it altogether. You pursue me behind and before, and lay your hands upon me. Such knowledge is wonderful for me. It is high and unattainable. Whither shall I go from your spirit? Or whither shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed and shield, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, let only darkness cover me, and the light about me be night. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, the darkness is as light to you. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You need to be together in my own I praise you, for you are fearfully and wonderfully made. <coughs> You know me very well. My friend must not be from you, and I was being made in secret, and to fill the world in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your will were written, and they were set home from me. Every day were ordained to me. How profound to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! If I look down, they are more than Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O oh God, and that the bloodthirsty would depart from me. Do I not hate them that hate you, O oh Lord? And do I not loathe them that rise up against you? Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. This morning it is now time for us to give back to God a portion of what he has given us. Will ushers please come forward? Through Christ our Lord. Amen. This morning as we 
shift into a time of prayer and meditation. Are there any prayer requests we need to lift up this morning? On the list, I see David Todd, Alvin Simmons, Joyce Letterbetter, and the Wayne Gary family. Are there any others to add? Hearing your mothers, let us go to God in prayer. Almighty God, we are so thankful that we get to be in your sanctuary today. We're so thankful that all these times in life, when things go wrong, when things don't go the way we expect them to, we can still come here on Sunday mornings and know that you are our God and we are your people. For that, we are grateful. This morning, you have heard names. You have heard People lift, lift it up before your throne of grace. And so we raise all these people before you, all those who are on our prayer list and all those who are on our hearts, God. We ask that your will would be done with these people. Where there's protection, we ask for protection. Where there's needs of guidance, we ask for guidance. Where there needs healing, Lord, if it is in your will, we ask for healing. We ask, oh God, that you would give hope, that you would give joy, that you would give peace. That you would give guidance to all those who go through many different things. We pray, Almighty God, for our church, for our denomination. We pray also for your universal church, that in all things your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, we pray today for our country and our state, and our local officials. We pray. Almighty God, for our president and our vice president, we pray for our governor, lieutenant governor, and all those officials who have been put in place by you. We ask, O oh God, that you please let them do your will in government. We ask, O oh God, that you be with our firefighters, our law enforcement, our first responders, our troops, God. Place a protection around these people and keep them safe. Lord, we pray for us today. That we would be people who would be just. That we would show your justice in this world. And that we would do your will. Almighty God, we pray this prayer in your will. And in the name of your Son, Jesus, who taught us to pray, our Father. Who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Our next hymn is found on page 400, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing.
You may be seated. Our scripture this morning comes to us from two places. First, the prophet Amos, chapter 5, verses 18 through 24. And then from the gospel, according to Luke, chapter 4, 16 through 20. So if you have your Bibles and would like to join with me, again, that is Amos chapter 5, 18 through 24, and Luke 4, 16 through 20. Hear now this word. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? It is darkness and not light. As if a man fled from a lion and a bear man, or went into the house and leaned his hand against the wall, and a serpent bit him. Is not the day of the Lord darkness, and not light, and gloom, with no brightness in it? I hate, I despise your feasts, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs to the melody of your hearts. I will not listen. But let justice roll down like mighty waters, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Hear now from the Gospel of Luke. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of God for us people, God. Thanks be to God. Let us create man in our own image. So, in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created. We learn in the very first chapter of the book of the Bible, of the book, the very first chapter of the first book of the Bible, Genesis, excuse me, that God created two genders, both man and woman in his image. Well, what does this mean? Well, in studying theology, we call this the Imago Dei, which is a fancy word in Latin that means the image of God. I used to think that the Imago Dei meant that we look like God. But this is really not the case, since God is spirit. Now, Jesus did become human, so when we get to heaven and we see Jesus, he will have a human body. The Imago Dei, instead, shows God's love and care for humans. When he wanted to create plants, he spoke to the ground. When he wanted to make fish, he spoke to the sea. But when he wanted to create humans, he spoke to himself. See, the Imago Dei reflects God, and it shows how much of a special creation we are. According to John Wesley, the main founder of the Methodist movement that became the Methodist Church, there were three things meant by the Imago Dei, or the image of God. You have things like the natural image of God, which means that we, like God, are spiritual beings with a free will. There's the political image of God, which means that we are governors in a created world, and we have relationships with one another. And finally, and arguably one of the most important ones, the moral image of God, which means that we are moral creatures, and we are meant to live holy. The Imago Dei was broken when Adam and Eve ate of the tree, and humans sinned and fell. But through Jesus, it is being repaired. Each person is created in God's image, and although it is broken because of sin, this means that all people are created equally before God, and they have the right to be treated with dignity and fairness 
no matter who they are. The Imago Day is also important because it is the foundation of biblical justice. Sometimes we turn on the news, we read the paper, and we hear about justice, and it becomes a sore topic to us. But I'm here today to tell you that biblical justice is nothing to be afraid of, and that it is so much more than the justice that our culture tries to push on us. So our first reading comes from Amos 5. But before we go into this, let's get a little background on who Amos is and what the book of Amos is about. We have to start at almost the very beginning of the Bible in Genesis. Out of all the families of the earth, God chose one, named Israel. These were descendants of a man named Abraham, and they were named after his grandson, Jacob, who God named Israel, meaning he who struggles with God. The people of Israel were made up of 12 tribes who were named after the sons and two of the grandsons of Jacob. Under the reigns of King David and King Solomon of Israel, the nation was united together. But after Solomon's death, there was a civil war, and they split into two. In the north, ten of the tribes came together and formed the nation of Israel with its capital of Samaria. And the nation was eventually conquered by Assyria in 722 B.C. In the south, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin united to form the nation of Judah, with his capital of Jerusalem. Judah, for their sins, was eventually conquered and exiled by the nation of Babylon in 587-86 BC. God sent prophets to the kings and people of both nations because they had simply turned away from God. Amos is one of these prophets. Amos prophesied in the late to middle 700s BC during the reigns of Uzziah, king of Judah, and Jeroboam II, king of Israel. Amos actually lived in the southern Jewish nation of Judah, in the village of Tekoa. And this is about 12 miles south of Jerusalem, Judah's capital city. We learn in Amos 7 that Amos was a farmer and a shepherd, and he says that he was not a prophet, nor was he the son of a prophet. Yet God called him to deliver a message to the people. Though Amos was from the nation of Judah, God actually sent him to prophesy against the nation of Israel in the north. Amos' message focused on our topic for today, justice. And he cries out against Israel's injustice. He calls out the people for exploiting the poor, cheating their customers, and buying off judges. He says that this injustice and corruption needs to stop one way or another. If the people don't stop it, God will. And as we can see, God did. Because in 722 B.C., Assyria would destroy and exile the people of Israel. And the ten northern tribes are lost to this day. The main point of this book is that God is going to punish the northern Jewish nation of Israel for a long list of sins. Especially exploiting the poor and selling justice to the highest bidding Right. With this, let's see what God is saying through his prophet Amos to the people of Israel and to us. Verse 18 says, Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord! Why would you have the day of the Lord? For it is darkness and not light. What is the day of the Lord? Well, as a whole, the day of the Lord is any time God acts decisively in judgment and or salvation. But more specifically, the event that Amos is talking about is something the prophets talk about a lot. It was a certain day in which God would return and there would be salvation for his people and damnation for the wicked and unjust. In the Old Testament, the day of the Lord was seen as this one great extravagant event in which God would break into history, into our current evil age, and then he would bring justice, peace, and glory. Later in the New Testament, through the writings of Paul, we can see that that wasn't necessarily the case. As the New Testament writers understood, there was two day of the Lord. They were two different events. The New Testament writers saw that the day of the Lord was both the first and the second coming of Christ. The prophets of the Old Testament 
did not realize that this great day of the Lord was actually two different events. And sometimes it's hard to tell if their prophecies are talking about the first coming of Jesus, the second, and sometimes even both. Jesus would come. And he would enter into our current evil age. And through his death and resurrection, he is brought in the beginning of God's kingdom of glory. This, my friends, is where we are living right now. But he is coming again. He is coming and he will bring the entirety of God's kingdom of glory. And evil will simply be no more. It was popular in Amos' day to believe that the day of the Lord would be a time of restoration of Israel to a military political, and economic greatness, like the reigns of Kings David and Solomon, this golden age of the nation of the United Kingdom. Israel thought that this was what Amos would say when he said the day of the Lord. Yet, instead, Amos preached against these ideas, and he points out that this would be a time of darkness and not joy. The rulers, the leaders, and even a majority of the people in Israel were wicked. They broke God's law. Yet in pride they hoped that the day of the Lord would come. In the great and awful day of the Lord, these people would be destroyed because of their sins. My friends, the great and awful day of the Lord is coming unto us. We call ourselves Christians, don't we? But yet we are just as unjust and wicked. As I said before, the day of the Lord was split into the two comings of our Lord. Jesus Christ will return. For those of us who are true and are faithful believers, we will live with our Lord forever and ever in His eternal kingdom. This is indeed light for us. Us believers, this day will be light and not darkness. But for those who are not believers, or those who pretend to love Jesus, the day of the Lord is not light. Instead, it is darkness. One day, Jesus Christ will return with the saints of ages and the angels of glory. And the question I want to ask you, where will you stand? Will you be like the wicked people of Israel and only live like your God's people in name only? Or will you be his true people? Baptized and sanctified by His Holy Spirit. The day of the Lord is coming. And Jesus is coming to judge the earth. Because of this, we must live holy. Verse 19 and 20 say, As if a man fled from a lion and a bear met him, or went into the house and leaned his hand against the wall and a serpent bit him, is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light and gloom with no brightness in it. If you had to run from a lion, only to meet a bear in your way, and then you think you have safety in your own home, only to lean your hand to flip on the light switch, and then a cobra bit you, you would probably say your day has gone from bad to worse to awful. This is how the day of the Lord will be for the wicked people, like the ones Amos is preaching against. We love our sins, yet God's righteous judgment cannot be escaped. The Bible tells us in Romans 6, 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We are born evil, and we stand against God. We deserve nothing but death in the fires of hell, but God has provided salvation in place of our damnation. He sent His Son Jesus his only begotten Son, Jesus, who is both God and man. He died in our place. He was beaten. He was mocked. And he was nailed to a cross for our sins. But yet, it wasn't nails that kept him there, my friends. It was love. Love for you and love for me. He bled for both you and me simply because he loves us. And this is the only way to escape the awful and great day of the Lord. Jesus Christ is our only salvation. Only through His grace may we be saved. Our sin is great, and we deserve death. But God's love and power is greater. Jesus has opened wide the gates of heaven. And if you trust in Him, 
you will be saved. It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter what you have done, what you have said, what you have thought. You can run to the Father through Jesus Christ the Son and give Him the glory for great things He has done. We need to turn from our wicked and our unjust ways and we need to simply turn to God. We love our sins, but our sin is against God. Adam and Eve tried to define good and evil for themselves, and we do the same exact thing. But we should do what God has said is good and right because it's righteous. And what he says is good is good. And what he says is evil is indeed evil. It's not that God wants to kill our fun or be a big meanie. No, these sins that we think are fun are simply our slave masters. And God knows the more and more we do them, the more and more enslaved we become. We end up not being able to do what we truly want. Sin controls our lives. Yet He knows, and we know this morning, that this sin leads away from Him. It leads to death and hell. Away from God forever and ever and ever. But yet, God loves us. God wants us. And Jesus Christ is the only way for our chains to be broken. He wants us. So run from your sin into the arms of the Father. For the day of the Lord is coming. God is coming to judge. And where will you stand? Verse 21 through 23 says, I hate, I despise your feasts, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs to the melody of your hearts, I will not listen. This part of Amos' message talks about a lot of worship practices of the people of Israel. See, in the first five books of the Bible, called the Law, or in Hebrew, the language of the Old Testament, is called the Torah. And God outlines the religious practices of the people, among other things, such as the Ten Commandments. These people had feast days, which were special days set aside for worship and thanksgiving to God. An example of this would be Passover. When the Jewish people celebrated, when they were slaves in Egypt, God passed over the houses marked with the lamb's blood, and he killed the firstborn of the Egyptians, even Pharaoh's own son. Another would be Yom Kippur, which from Hebrew means the Day of Atonement. This was and still is the holiest of Jewish holidays. In Leviticus, two goats were used in this festival. One of them sacrificed, and the other had the sins of the people symbolically placed on them by the high priest. That goat was then sent off into the wilderness. This is known as the scapegoat. These were just a few of their holy days, but offerings were another part of these holy days and their normal worship practice. There were different types of offerings for different things, and mentioned here by Amos is some of these offerings. Here he mentions the burnt offering the grain offering, and the peace offering. Burnt offerings were commanded to be done by God for the forgiveness of sins. Three animals were used. Bulls, usually bought by the rich. Sheep and goats, usually bought by middle class people. And then turtle doves and pigeons, which were usually bought by the poor. Worshippers brought their sacrifice to the priest, and they laid their hands on the animal, and this removed their sins, and the animal was put to death in their place. In God's justice, blood is required for sin's forgiveness. And this would give the person a, a forgiveness from the wrath and a peace with God for a temporary time under the Old Testament law. Later, Jesus would be sacrificed to give forgiveness to all who would trust in Him. See, God sees these, these burnt offerings and He says, Your heart's not in it. You don't truly want my forgiveness or else you would stop doing the things you're doing. So my question for you this morning, are you ignorant like the people of Israel? Are you coming to church asking forgiveness? Forgive us of our debts as we forgive those who sin against us. 
and yet don't mean it. Is God abhorred by what you're doing? The next one is the grain offering, which was almost offered as much as the burnt offering, and they were often offered together. The offering was used to thank God for his mercies and provided for the people's needs. Actually, only a bit of this was offered, and the rest went to provide for the priests. If you're offering to God, thanking him for his blessings and his mercies, yet your heart's not in it, is he despised by what you're doing? Finally, and most importantly, the peace offering was brought out of the overflow of a person's heart. God didn't really command these like he commanded the grain and the burnt offerings. And this offering could be done at any time. It was offered during three situations. First, there was the free will offerings, which was given in, in response to God's unexpected generosity. Second, the vow offering was brought to celebrate an answer to prayer after a person vowed to praise the Lord if God answered his prayer. And third, the peace offering for thanksgiving is probably better translated from Hebrew to English as a confession or praise offering that was given when someone was in dire need of deliverance. These three offerings would be the only ones the people would eat. This foreshadows the Lord's Supper in the New Testament. Part was offered up and then the people would eat. This shows that peace with God is like a great feast. The problem with this is these people were trying to have peace with God, yet weren't listening to what he said. How many of us are the same way? We come to church, we pray, we read our Bibles, and we attempt to have peace with God, yet we don't follow what he says. Just like our worship, a third part of Jewish worship was singing psalms and songs. And Amos, God hates the people's worship. Why? Well, as I've said earlier, their hearts were not in it. They just kind of went through the motions. They were corrupt, unjust, and wicked, but yet they still offered these offerings for forgiveness and peace to God. God had promised that if Israel honored them with their lives, with their whole heart, he would accept their sacrifices and hear their words. By saying that he no longer accepts their sacrifices or listens to them, God is rejecting their worship as hypocritical, dishonest, and utterly meaningless. Their actions may have followed what the Bible said in terms of you use this amount of, of grain, you, you take this animal, you kill this animal at this point. But simply put, their hearts were not in it. They did not know God. Where are our hearts in our worship? Not just Sunday, not at this moment right now, but where would your heart be an hour from now? Are we hypocritical? Are we dishonest? Are we meaningless worshipers? If we look at the church as a whole, I think we are. Our hearts are far from God, and we need to turn back to Him and worship Him in spirit and in truth. Stop being like Israel and truly, through the power of the Holy Spirit, worship your God and follow His commands. Will God listen to our, our songs and our hymns, or will He not? Will He accept our offerings, or will He call us hypocritical and fake worshipers? Verse 24 says, But let justice roll down like waters, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. I didn't plan this today, um, but I realized this Friday, when I said that I was preaching on Amos and had my sermon written. It's kind of ironic that tomorrow is Martin Luther King Jr. Day, because this was Martin Luther King Jr.'s favorite Bible verse. <coughs> After dismissing Israel's empty worship, God calls for the rolling waters of justice and the streams of righteousness, which is the only foundation for true praise and worship of God. The Hebrew word for justice in this verse is mishpat. And this word can often mean justice, for someone, or it can mean something much like a court case. But it's often used to talk about advocating for vulnerable. If justice is the foundation for the worship of God, what is justice? We hear a lot about justice being thrown around in our day. We hear a lot of times social justice, and this kind of makes us uneasy. But I'm here to teach you about what biblical justice is. 
What is the difference between worldly social justice that our culture pushes on us and true biblical justice? The difference is not in how they use the word justice, though there are some major differences. The difference is in how they use the word injustice. Biblical injustice is that which goes against God's law in our relationship to Him and to all people. However, social justice is anything that equals or produces an unequal outcome. By this definition, the world would say that God is unjust because there are things that He has done unequally. For example, I am shorter than a lot of people, and that's an inequality because God made someone taller than me. Shaquille O'Neal is taller than me, and that would be an injustice. See, the world the way God designed it would not be seen as socially just because it is filled with inequality. But do we want everyone to be the same height, have the same hair, have the same level of intelligence, like the same stuff, play the same sport? No! This creates diversity in our world. But this is what social justice is after. We want justice, but what do we mean by justice? We said it this morning. We told God in the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is biblical justice. See, biblical justice has a social aspect to it. We are social creatures engaged in social holiness. But real biblical justice is God-centered. It's not human-centered. Real biblical justice looks to obey God and honor His Word. Yes, the Bible does tell us to care for the vulnerable, the widows, the poor, the orphans. And we should recognize the image of God in all people and treat them with respect. But we have to make sure that our idea of justice is in line with that of God's commandments. I think it's helpful here. Not only am I a Bible and English major, but I'm a philosophy minor. And the philosopher Plato who was ancient Greek, about 300 years before Christ, he said that justice is when people work properly together. They work right in their city towards each other. And as we recognize the image of God in people, as followers of, of Plato would later say, we should recognize that we have a duty to that person, to be just towards them, to love them as God loves them, to see the image of God in them and realize that involved in justice we have a duty towards them. They are made in His image, and we should love them and treat them with respect. Micah asks us in chapter 6, in verse 8 of his book, He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Yes, my friends, do justice, but true justice. Love kindness. Treat others with love and respect, but realize that in loving people, we may have to tell them some things they simply don't want to hear. And above all, no matter the consequences, no matter who says anything, no matter if you get disowned, if you get pushed away, walk with your God. So how do we let justice work? We can look at our gospel lesson this morning. When Jesus says to proclaim good news to the poor, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. All these different things Christ came to proclaim. This is true biblical justice. To let justice roll, we have to realize that only through Jesus can true biblical justice roll down like mighty waters. We are sinful, and we are unable to do justice. Unlike the kings and the people of Israel, Jesus Christ is the great king of Israel, who is able to perfectly love everybody and show true biblical justice to all. Jesus Christ is making all things new. By his death and his resurrection, he has crushed hell, death, and Satan under his feet. And Jesus is setting all things right. Only through Jesus can we show justice, because true justice is in line with God's laws. And only through Jesus can we, by the power of the Holy Spirit, align us with God's law. 
care for the widow, the orphan, and the oppressed, and let justice roll down like mighty waters, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, and show God's true biblical justice to all those we meet. So, Smyrna, will you let justice roll? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our last hymn this morning is found on United Methodist Hymnal, page 386. My hope is built. We'll stand and join with you there.